بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. If you're here for the lecture or for the class, please come forward a bit closer. Continuing with the chapter of uh, zakah from the book Amdu al Fiqh of Imam Ibn Qudam al Maqdasi rahimahullah ta'ala, we reach now the chapter where he says, Bab zakat al Athman. The chapter where he's talking about Athman, the zakah of the Athman. What does he mean by Athman? Athman is the plural of Thaman, which means values. So he's going to talk about how to give zakah on the value of gold, on the value of silver, on the value of currencies, on the value of trade stock and items as such. So any type of value which reaches a particular level in Islam of currency or of wealth, then we need to give zakah upon that, as I will come to explain, inshallah, by Allah's permission. And he says, وَهِيَ النَّوْعَانِ ذَهَبٌ وَفِضَّةٌ This currency or this value is of two types, that of gold and that of silver. Okay? And we said uh, also we add to the gold and the silver currencies because all of them, they have what in common? They have the fact that they are values, values by which people interact and trade, buy and sell. Okay? وَلَا زَكَاءَ فِي الْفِضَّةِ حَتَّى تَبْلُغَ مِئَتَيْ دِرْحَمْ And there's no zakah in the fiddah, in the silver, until it reaches 200 pieces, 200 dirhams. Dirhams from the time of the Prophet ﷺ. In today's day and age, we can say, the ulama, they say it's 595 grams of pure silver. If it reaches 595 grams of pure silver, that is your nisab, that is the level of wealth. If it reaches that, then you have to base the care on that and anything above that. The Imam he says, فَيَجِبُ فِيهَا خَمْسَ دَرَاهِمْ Then it's imperative that you pay from this 200 grams, 200 dinars, which I said are 595 grams. You pay the Imam, he said, خَمْسَ دَرَاهِمْ You pay five uh, coins, five of dirhams from that 200 which in essence equals to 2.5%, okay? 2.5% of the value of 595 grams of silver, okay? So if you want to pay it according to the silver, you look at the value of 595 grams of silver in the market at the time you're going to pay the zakah. So let's say, for example, 595 grams of silver equals to around, in UK pounds, let's say 230 pounds. 230 UK pounds, then you pay 2.5% of 230 UK pounds, and that is the zakah that you need to pay. Of course, if you have more than that, if you have more than nisab, then you include all of the value of the wealth that you have. But if all you have is 595 grams, which is the nisab, you would pay 2.5% of that. The Imam, he says, وَلَا فِي الذَّهَبْ حَتَّى يَبْلُغَ إِشْرِينَ مِثْقَالِ and nor do you have to, and the nisab of the dhahab, the nisab of the gold is 20 mithqal. 20 mithqal, okay? Again, in modern terms, we can say that's 85 grams of 24 karat gold. 85 grams of pure gold. So, you look at what 85 grams of gold is in the marketplace at the time you want to give your zakah. Let's say, for example, it's around 2,300 UK pounds. Then you would pay 2.5% of that value or any other currency or any other value of items that you have above that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the minimum threshold of wealth that you need to have, if you look at it from the aspect of silver, it's 595 grams of silver. If you look at it from the aspect of gold, it's 85 grams of gold. Okay? So whichever one you use, you look at the value on the day that you are paying the zakah. If you have money which equates to that value, then it's a must upon you to pay zakah on that and everything above that that you own. Okay? If you have less than that, those two values, okay, 595 silver, 85 gold, then there's no zakah upon you. Okay? There's no zakah upon you if the money that you have is less than that. So the Imam, he says... فَيَجِبُ فِيهِ نِصْفُ مِثْقَالِ And with regards to the gold, you have to pay half of mithqal, which with the mathematics works out to be 2.5%. فَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا غِشْ Now he's saying that if you have the gold and the silver, but they're not pure in the sense that they have other materials, other metals mixed with them, what do you do? 
فإمام يسأل فلا زكاة فيهما حتى حتى يبلغ قدر الذهب والفضة نصابا. There's no zakah in this material that you have. You have gold or you have silver, but it's mixed with other metals. There's no zakah in those materials unless the gold in that material reaches the level, the threshold of 85 grams, or the silver in that material, mix of materials, reaches 595 grams, okay? You have to find out how much gold you have in all of that composition of metals that you have and how much silver you have in all of the composition of silver. So he says, فَإِن شَكَّ فِي ذلك, If you're doubtful, you're not sure. خُيِّرَ بَيْنَ الْإِخْرَاجِ وَبَيْنَ سَبْكِهِمَا لِيَعْلَمَا قَدْرَ ذلك. If you're not sure in this uh, mix of metals what's, what's there, then you have the choice. Either you can pay the weight as it is. So for example, it might end up being more than 595 grams, right? Of silver or more than 85 grams of gold. You can do that. You can pay more even though the material in there was not all gold or the material in there was not all silver. This is what the Imam was saying. It's up to you. You can go ahead and just pay the value of the whole of the composition that you have. Or you can do what he said after sabkihima, after you put it through the process of removing the extra materials. You have to purify the gold and you have to purify the silver from the metals contained therein. Once you've done that in the way that the jewelers, they know how to do so, then you pay the gold and uh, you pay the zakah upon the gold or the silver after having purified it, okay? But in any case, what remains is the nisab is 595 of silver or the nisab is 85 grams of gold. That, that is what is the important thing for us to remember. Here's a mas'ala. Mas'ala meaning something which is asked about, something which is thought about in fiqh, from the word su'al. So mas'ala is that if you have, let's say you have 70 grams of gold, is that the nisab? It's less than nisab, right? There's no zakat upon you. And if you have 400 grams of silver, is that nisab? No nisab. Tayyib, but what if you put them together? The value now, the value now of those two commodities could well equal the nisab, right? So many of the ulama, they say that you should do that. In fact, it's the Hanbali opinion, the Maliki opinion, and the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. They say you should do that. What is their proof? In Surah Tawbah, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Those who hoard gold and silver, and they do not spend it in the path of Allah, so uh, give them tidings of a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a severe punishment. Now in the Arabic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the pronoun for the two commodities, ha, which is a singular pronoun. So that's why the ulama who hold this opinion, they say Allah looked upon it as one commodity. Why? Because it is one commodity in reality. They share the value. They, they, they're about values. And that's what the whole thing, the whole discussion is here. Okay? Silver is a value. Gold is a value that people trade in. So according to this opinion, you can join the two okay, commodities to reach the nisab if each one of them individually does not reach the nisab. Not each one of them, if one of them does not reach the nisab, okay? So you can join them together to reach the nisab. Uh, you should join them together to reach the nisab and then pay the zakah from that if that is your situation. The Imam, he says, وَلَا زَكَى فِي الْحُلِي الْمُبَاح الْمُعَدْ لِلْإِسْتِعْمَالْ وَالْعَارِيَةِ He's now talking about jewelry, okay? He's spoken to us now about what is the level of the nisab. Now he's talking about wealth of jewelry, okay? Wealth of jewelry. He said, there's no zakah. There's no zakah in the permissible jewelry, okay? There's no zakah in the permissible jewelry which has been prepared for use. So you bought it to use, okay? Well, uh, aria. Aria is that you loan it out. You lend it out without taking anything in return for it, <clears throat> okay? So if your cousins, your relatives, your close friends, they want to borrow from you the jewelry, especially the women, they do this between each other, then they can loan it out if they loan it out, then there's no zakah upon that wealth of the jewelry, okay? This is the opinion of Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed, okay? Because they say that here that this wealth is not intended to be invested for growth. The whole point about the zakah is zakah on wealth which grows, okay? If wealth doesn't grow or it cannot be invested for growth, or it doesn't have the idea of growth behind it, then there's no zakah upon it, okay? So here the jewelry which is bought for use or the jewelry which is bought for, he said, aria is going to be lent out. 
then this jewelry, there's no zakah upon it, okay? Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, Shaykh Imbaz and others, they say zakah must be paid on it, okay? So for the group of ulama who said that there's no zakah upon it, they say that if it's not worn at least once a year, then it's safer to pay zakah on it. So the woman, she buys this jewelry, her intention was to wear it, but she never got around to wearing it. In this situation, it's closer to treasure. So it's better for her to pay the zakah on it out of safety, okay? For the sake of being safe. طيب. So those who say that it's uh, obligatory, or those who say there's no zakah upon this uh, jewelry, they take from the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abu Huraira, where the Prophet وسلم, said, Laysa ala al-Muslim fi abdihi wa la farasihi sadaqa. Laysa ala al-Muslim fi abdihi wa la farasihi sadaqa. There's not upon the believer with regards to his servant, his slave, or with regards to his riding beast, zakah. So where is the proof from this hadith that you don't need to give zakah on jewelry which is being used? Okay. Okay, good. Very close. So the hadith here, it's alluding to the fact that the things which are for your personal use, you are using for personal use, right? Like the servant and the riding beast, there's no zakah upon them. Likewise, qiyas is made upon that jewelry which you use. There's no zakah upon it because it's not for trade. It's not for investment. It's for use only or for lending out. Okay, this was the opinion also of Aisha radiallahu anha, Asma bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, uh, Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, uh, Anas radiyallahu anhu, and Jabir radiyallahu anhu. So five of the major companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held the opinion that you do not give zakah on the items we mentioned, jewelry which is for use and jewelry which is there for lending out. Permissible jewelry, right? Those who say yes, they go back to the verse that we mentioned before. Those who say yes, you have to pay the zakah, like Imam Abu Hanifa, Shaykh Imbaz and others, rahimahullah ta'ala, they say, look at the verse in Surah At-Tawbah which we mentioned. وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبُ وَالْفِضَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Those who hoard gold and silver, they hoard, they keep the gold and silver, and they do not spend it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then give them tidings of a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the wajhu dalala? Wajhu dalala meaning what is the point of evidence from the verse? The wajhu dalala from the verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make any differentiation in the status of gold here. He didn't say that, you know, there's a particular type of gold where you don't have to give the zakah. It was just one category. Gold, if you have the gold, you should pay fi sabilila. You should give the zakah fi sabilila. Okay, this is according to their understanding, those who said that you must pay zakah. These are from some of their evidences. Of course, they have many more on each side of the argument. What did that Imam say? What was the opinion of that Imam and those who agreed with him? Pay zakah or don't pay zakah on jewelry, which you use, huh? Don't pay zakah on jewelry, which you use. Okay, good. Tayyib, so the Imam, he says, وَيُبَاحُ nisa كُلُّ مَا جَرَّتْ عَادَتُهُنَّ بِلَبْسِهِ مِنَ الذهب والفضة. It's permissible for the women to wear to wear from gold and silver that which is customar customarily the norm in their society. So that which is customarily the norm in the society, the women, they can wear the gold and silver. We wish this part is not recorded, right? So our wives don't. The women, they can wear whatever they want from gold and silver with certain conditions. It has to be the norm in their society, meaning that it shouldn't be that they're trying to follow the fashion or the ways of those who are foreign to their society, meaning the ways of those who are non-Muslim, because a lot of the non-Muslim fashion is something which Islam would frown upon, like having gold rings in your belly button and things like this, right? Strange things. Islam doesn't allow that. And nor does it allow for you to follow the ways of those who Allah is not pleased with in their behavior, okay? So it shouldn't be done in that purpose, wearing gold and jewelry like that. Secondly, it shouldn't be gold and jewelry, which is israf, meaning it's just so extravagant. It's way beyond the means of the person's living, right? She doesn't want her husband to get a second wife, so she's always making sure he's poor, spending all of his money. Joking. If it's the case that you know, this, it's just too expensive, according to their living means, then this also is not right, because then it becomes israf. But everything else, basically, she can wear. Uh, she's allowed to wear from gold and silver. The Imam says, وَيُبَاحُ And it's permissible. وَيُبَاحُ لِلْرِجَالِ مِنَ فِضَّةِ 
it's permissible for men to wear from fiddha al khatim or al khatim a ring this is the first of the things that he talks about why do you think it's permissible for men to wear a ring hmm? because the prophet sallallahu wore one right the hadith in bukhari muslim of ibn umar radiyallahu anhu where it's mentioned اتَّخَذَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ خَاتِمًا مِنْ فِضَّةٍ فَاتَّخَذَ النَّاسِ خَوَاتِيمَ الْفِضَّةِ The Prophet ﷺ took a ring from silver, so the people, they took rings from silver. But Shaykh Khalid al-Mushaykh, حَفِظَ الله, one of the explainers of this book and many others, they say in reality, and our Imam also, if you look at his wording, he said مُبَاح, he didn't say مُسْتَحَب. مُبَاح means it's permissible, no one's going to say to you, don't do it. Right? But mustahab now means that it has a shari ruling in the sense that it's rewarded for you to do so. Allah has, or the Prophet ﷺ has recommended you to do this. So Shaykh Khalid al-Mushaykh and others, they say it's not sunnah. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't take it as sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ took it as hajah. He done it after the people said to him, his, um, because he used to have correspondence with the kings and the emperors. They said to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that these emperors and these kings, they do not accept correspondence unless it has a seal. So then they made for the Prophet ﷺ a ring with the seal on it, with his seal on it. That was the reason the Prophet ﷺ took the ring. It wasn't out of uh, an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to this opinion, which quite a few of the ulama they hold. Tayyip. So, if you are to wear a ring, it's recommended that you wear the ring on the khinsar. On the khinsar, which is on the left hand, the small finger, the pinky, I think they call it in English, right? The khinsar. And it's mubah, it's permissible to wear it on the binsar or the ibham. Mustahab, this one. Mubah, this one, and this one. Makru, disliked, is the wusta and the sababa. Okay, these two fingers are makru. Tayyib. And it should be on the left hand. The Imam, he says, So it's permissible for men to wear from silver, what? A silver ring. And also the Hilyatu Saif, okay? Hilyatu Saif is like where the sword is going to be held from around that area. The Sahaba, some of them, they used to have silver there to decorate it, okay? Because if you're a warrior, then the things that you go to war with are very important to you and you like them to be looking good, right? So the things around the, the handle of the sword, that can also be used in silver. And the Imam says, Wal mintaqa. Mintaqa is something which is used to tighten the clothing around the middle. Okay, so you could say it's like a belt buckle. Yippee, everyone says they can go now and get a silver belt buckle to look good, right? So this is also permissible. You can have that fashion, the Amani belt buckles, which are made of silver or whatever, no problem, right? As long as it doesn't fall into the other categories of being disliked. And then the Imam says, وَنَحْوُهَا And things which are similar to it, like for example, other items which are used for jihad, uh, like armor or uh, arrowheads or anything of that nature, okay? Anything which is similar to it, which is permissible, then the men are allowed to wear that. The Imam says, فَأَمَّا الْمُعَادْ لِلْكِرَاءِ وَالْإِدِّخَارِ and why the Imam, he mentioned these things, because obviously there's no zakah on these things, right? Because it falls under the same category that the women, they are exempt from zakah on the jewelry that they use. For the men, likewise, this is kind of a jewelry, right? So they are exempt from the zakah in these items. فَأَمَّا الْمُعَادِ الْكِرَاءِ وَالْإِدِّخَارِ As for the, that jewelry of gold and silver, which is kept as an investment, okay? Or it's there to be lent out for a return of money, Okay? In these two situations, if it's an investment or it's, it's going to be lent out for a return of currency, or the muharram or the golden jewelry is haram of a haram type, fafihi zakah, or the gold and silver, I should say, not the gold uh, and silver jewelry, or gold and silver. If, if it's of a haram type, then there will be zakah. Okay? So if it's kept for an investment or if it's kept for lending out gold and silver, or if it's of a haram type, then you have to pay zakat on that, okay? So give me an example of uh, haram gold. One which is stolen, for sure. But haram gold in other areas that we have studied. Anything which is stolen is haram, right? In that sense. I want to leave that. 
Ahsant, Zakallah khair. Gold worn by men. So it's not allowed, right? For man to wear gold. So now if he, or, uh, if he beautifies himself with gold, then he has to pay zakat on that, right? And he's also going to be sinful. He should get rid of the gold or do something else with it. Because the qaida amongst the ulama is ma hurima isti'maluhu wajaba ikhraju zakatihi. That that which is impermissible to use, then you have to give zakat on that. Okay? So gold, for example, are we allowed to have gold and silver utensils in the house? We're not, right? So if we have gold and silver utensils, like we took in Kitab al-Tahara, it's not allowed. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said it's for them in the dunya and for you, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ And for you in the akhirah, right? لَا تَشْرَبُوا مِنْ آنِيَةِ الدَّهَبِ الْوَفِضَّةِ فَإِنَّهَا لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَكُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ Then on these items you have to give zakah. Taib, the Imam, he says, the next thing he mentions, بَاب حُكْمْ دَيْن The Imam is going to talk about now, how does debts impact upon the zakah that we give? Debts, okay? That's that we owe, that's that we are to, to receive. Brother, you're an accountant, right? So if I mix my terms up, just remind me, inshallah. I haven't studied accountancy for 25 years, right? طيب. So he says, وَمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ الدَّيْنَ عَلَى الْمَلِي So whoever has a debt owed to him from a rich person. Whoever has a debt owed to him from a rich person. أو مال يمكن خلاصه Or some type of wealth that he can get back. He's given wealth to somebody and he's able at any time he wants to get that wealth back. Like a person who doesn't accept that you have lent him money or gold or silver. This person doesn't accept it, but you have a witness or you have proof. So if you went to the judge, you'd get that money back. Okay? Or somebody has stolen money from you, but you've got 20 sons, you can easily go out, chase the thief, and get that money, money back. Meaning you have the ability to get the stolen money back from the thieves or whoever took it. All of these categories that we just mentioned, regardless of how long the money is away from you, by virtue of the fact that you are able to get it back, it's considered that it's still your money. It's still in your position, so you have to give zakah for it. When do you give the zakah? You give the zakah when it's returned to you, okay? When the money is returned to you, the wealth is returned to you, you give zakah for the period of time the money was out of your possession. Whether that be a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, okay? Whatever the time be, whenever you get that wealth back, you pay the zakah for each year that the money or the wealth was out of your possession. And some of the ulama, they say you can still give it every year if you feel that's easier for you and better for you to, to get done with. Okay, because that in a way it's better for you to get it done with because it's a debt that you owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyip. Here, why do you think they allow in this situation that I mentioned, or why do they say that you can wait to give the zakah until the wealth comes back to you? And that you do not have to, it's not obligatory upon you to give it every year. They're saying to you in this situation of the wealth which you can get back, because I gave you different categories, right? But they all fall under the title of wealth which you can get back if you so wished. Like the rich person that you can get wealth back from him. In these categories, in these situations, why did the ulama say to us, pay the zakah on it when you receive the wealth back? So they're giving you the opportunity, they're giving you the choice that you don't have to pay it every year. You can wait for the five years, the 20 years, the 30 years, when it's paid back to you, then you pay the zakah on that which has passed. Why? Why are they giving you this opportunity? Ascent, very good. Because there's a risk that you may not get paid. Something may happen to that wealth, right? So then you end up losing out. And also because you weren't actually able to invest that wealth. You weren't actually able to make it grow. And we said one of the maqasid of the wealth is to namu, to make it grow, right? How do we pay zakah on the wealth after we've received it? It has to be a whole, right? So you have, so you receive the wealth now, let's say after five years, you wait for a whole, right? But then how do you pay the zakah on these five years? Not only once. In this situation, not only once. In this situation, you pay for the full five years. So for 5,000 pounds, for example, you pay the 2.5% in the first year on the whole 5,000 pounds. In the second year, you minus that zakah that you paid 
I don't know what that will come to. Let's say, for example, it comes to 4,800. Then you pay 2.5% on the 4,800. In the third year, likewise, you minus the zakah. Let's say it comes to 4,600. You pay on the 4,600 like this, okay? It's not that you pay on the 5,000 amount every year. No, because it will decrease every time you pay zakah on it. Tayyib. The Imam, he says, now he's going to another category. The first category came under the title or the heading of where we can get our money back. I think it's called a good debt, right? In accounts terms, a good debt, right? Money that you know is going to come back to you. Now he's going to talk about bad debts. وَإِنْ كَانَ مُتَعَذِّرًا كَدَّيْنَ عَلَى الْمُفْسِلِسِ Now, if it's a, a debt, you've lent somebody this wealth, but now the person that you lent it to has become bankrupt, the Imam says. Or upon one who's refusing to accept that you lent him the money and you have no proof to prove it to the Qadi, to the judge. Or somebody has stolen your money and this time your sons are traveling, you, they're away. You can't go back and get the money from the thieves. Or lost wealth of any form that you fear that you may never find again. Okay? So if this wealth, you can, you, in these categories, it's a bad debt, then on this wealth, there's no zakah, okay? Even if it amounts to a million dollars or whatever, right? There's no wealth because you're, it's as though you don't have it. Because it's the likelihood is that you're not going to get it back, right? Some of scholars, they add to this uh, a type of pension. They say like the state pensions. They say the state pensions you know you're going to be paid something like, let's say, 20,000 UK pounds at the end of your service with the company. But they say there's no zakat upon you for that wealth because, number one, you have no control over it. You, you can't spend it. It's not with you, right? So it falls under this category. You only pay it once it comes in your um, presence, once it comes in your control. Once the state gives it to you, once the, once the state gives it to you, and you can spend from it as you wish, then you pay the zakah for it only once. And also in these categories that I mentioned, which is bad debt, if it's returned to you somehow, after 10 years, 5 years, whatever it be, you do not have to do like with the good debt. You do not have to pay for every single year that passed. You can pay for only one year, okay? You can pay for only one year. طيب. The Imam, he says, وَحُكْمُ الصَّدَاقِ حُكْمُ الدَّيْنِ the hukum of the dowry, which is given in um, marriage, is the same rulings as the rulings of the debt which we took. If it's going to be, if the wife knows that the husband will pay it, right, she has to give zakat on it when she receives it. If the wife feels for whatever reason that she's come to know that her husband is a very bad person, he's not going to pay it, then in this situation, there's no zakat on that amount of the wealth. طيب. The Imam says, وَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنٌ يَسْتَغْرِخُ النِّصَابِ and whoever has a debt which equates to the level of the nisab, the level of the threshold, which is 595 grams of uh, silver, 85, 85 grams of gold, right? If you have a debt which equates that wealth, that if you were to pay this debt, that wealth is going to go. You're not going to have any nisab left, or it's going to decrease. Or ينقصه فلا زكاة عليه فيه Or it's going to bring the nisab down, the amount of wealth you have down is going to be lower than the nisab, then there's no wealth upon you. Okay? So the Imam here is saying if you have a debt that you have to pay, and it's equal to the amount of the nisab, if you pay this debt, your nisab goes completely. Or it decreases, there's no debt upon you. Why? Because, the, uh, because uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, as in the muwatta of Imam Malik, is mentioned, Kana yaqulu fi Ramadan, he used to say in Ramadan, Hada shahru zakatikum, this is the month of your zakah. فَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَيْهِ دَيْنْ فَلْيَقْدِيهِ So whoever has a debt that he has to pay, so then let him get rid of that debt, let him pay that debt. وَزَكُّوا بَقِيَةَ أَمْوَالِكُمْ And then pay zakah on any money that you have left. So of course, before giving the zakah, we know that from the teachings of Uthman and the companions, is that we have to pay our debts. And if the debt was the, of the same level of the nisab, or uh, even uh, a little bit less than that, it means you have no money left which equates to nisab. You have no money left after paying the debt which is obligatory for you to pay zakat upon, right? But if you paid the uh, debt, let's say for example, a month before the zakat due date, right? 
and you found that you still had a lot of money left in your trade goods or whatever, which equaled the nisab, then you have to go ahead and pay zakah on that which is left. In any case, what we're saying is that before you pay the zakah, it's allowed for you to pay off the debts. Uh, it's it's in, incumbent upon you to pay off the debts which are close, which are uh, kind of immediate debts. If they're deferred debts, if they're a debt that you don't have to pay for another 10 years, 5 years or something of that nature, then that debt is not included. But if it's aqsat, if it's in portions, like a mortgage which is generally haram, but if people do have them, then they can deduct from their uh, zakah the, the amount of mortgage payment for that particular year, okay? Before they pay the zakah. This is what I'm trying to say. Shaykh Uthaymin Rahimullah Ta'ala, he says in Sharh al Mumta, uh, after mentioning this, had, this author of uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said there's another reason here that why there's no zakah in this situation. He said if the person was to pay zakah on this wealth, then he gives it back to the person he owes it to. What's that person going to do with that wealth? He's going to also pay zakah on it. So you've ended up paying zakah twice on this amount of wealth. Okay? So he says from the nadr, from the intelligence, it also doesn't make sense. Though this is not his opinion, but he's mentioning it in his explanation of those who hold this opinion, that the debt, uh, if it equals the nisab or it lessens the nisab, then there's no zakah upon it. Is that clear, inshallah? See a bit of confusion there. It's clear? Tayyib, inshallah. Other ulama, in fact, the majority, Imam Shafi'i, the Mu'tamad Hanbali opinion, the agreed upon Hanbali opinion, or the more famous Hanbali opinion, Imam Malik and others, they say, no, you have to pay upon all types of debt, right? You have to pay upon this type of debt uh, for sure, zakah. Even if it's going to uh, mean that once you pay the debt, you will have no, uh, no nisab. Why? They say, look, when the Prophet Sallallahu used to send out his envoys to collect zakah, it was never mentioned ever in any of the narrations that they would ask the people, do you have debts? It was never ever mentioned, okay? So they say based upon this, this is not a consideration. The consideration is if that the money is with you at that particular time, then you have to pay the zakah, okay? So if the money is with you, you have to pay the zakah. But as we said, it's imperative that we live our lives without trying to fall into debt. And whenever you have a debt, you try to remove it from yourself as quick as you can, inshallah. The Imam, he moves on now to Bab uh, Zakat Al-Urud, Urud Al-Tijara. The chapter pertaining to zakat upon trade goods, okay? Taib, Bab Zakat Al-Urud. Urud, it has the meaning of that which is displayed, and then removed, okay? So trade goods are generally that which is displayed and removed, okay? And it's to do with value. So because it's to do with value, zakah is given upon it, a value which can increase or decrease. وَلَا زَكَاءَ فِيهَا حَتَّى يَنْوِيَ بِهَا التِّجَارَةَ Trade goods of any sort, there's no zakah upon them until the person has an intention that he wants to trade in these goods, okay? So say for example, he has with him 10 brand new iPhones. And for whatever reason, he's mutaraddad. He's not sure, you know, every day I want to use a different phone. Or he's, not, or he's thinking at the same time, maybe I should use these for trade and make money from them. Each one of them is worth a thousand UK pounds, right? So there's 10,000 pounds in value. I should trade in them. But he hasn't made the intention firm, right? So a taraddud finniya, uh, to have this doubt in niya, this back and forth, is as though there is no intention, right? As he mentioned uh, by Imam Ba'uti and others. So until he makes a firm intention, and a year passes upon that intention, and what he is trading in reaches the nisab of 595 grams of silver or 85 grams of gold, then there's no zakah upon these goods, okay? So it could be that somebody has trade goods but then he changes his mind he has 10 iPhones like we said that he's going to put up for trade but in the midst of the year he changes his mind he says no I just want to play with them I want to use them so here there's no zakah because it hasn't been a whole year he changed his intention right so the important thing is that Imam he says there's no zakah until the person makes niya of tijara niya of trade Sheikh Abdullah Salama Shawayir in his explanation of Umdat al-Fiqh, 
he says that is not enough just to have the niyyah. He says what it means here in this chapter of trade goods is that there has to be some action taking place to show that this person is actually wanting to trade these goods. So for example, he makes an advertisement, right? Something like this, or he goes to the trade fair and he wants to trade in these goods. Okay, he puts them out for display. These kind of things have to be there, okay? But other scholars, they say, no, just by the fact that he has a true intention to trade, then that's enough. Wahiya nisab, meaning that they should, these trade goods, they should equal a nisab of uh, gold or silver. One thing I forgot to mention, um, which nisab should we use? Should we use the nisab of gold or should we use the nisab of silver when giving our zakah? The same, huh? Anybody else? Pardon? Combination? No, don't combine them unless you have to. Yeah, silver is correct. The majority of the ulama, they say silver. Why? Because hada anfa' lil fuqara. This is more beneficial. Why? Because if you look, I'll just give you estimations from what I remember. Uh, in UK pounds, for example, 85 grams of gold is the nisab of that is something like 2,300 pounds, right? 2,300 pounds. The nisab of 595 grams of silver, however, is about 200 and something pounds. So look at the difference. Silver is 200 something pounds. Gold is 2,000 and something pounds. Not everybody has 2,000 and something pounds saving after a year, but many people have 200 and something pounds saving, right? So therefore, it's going to be a lot more beneficial to the poor in the ummah, meaning that a lot more people will be able to give zakah. Or a lot more people, it will be obligatory upon them to give zakah. That's why the ulama, they say you should look to the nisab of silver because you will reach the nisab quicker and therefore you will give zakah. Right? More people give zakah, meaning more will benefit from that. So the imam, he says with regards to the trade goods, there has to be intention and there has to be nisab. So the nisab is on the value of the goods, not on the quantity. Why do I mention this? So say for example, you have 10 sheep which is worth 3,000 pounds. If it was based on quantity, is there zakah here? There's no zakah here, remember? We said last week 40 sheep, right? 40 to 120 is when the zakah is obligatory upon you. So if we were to do it based upon the quantity, no zakah, but rather it's based upon the value. These 10 sheep, they could be worth 5,000 UK pounds, right? So we have to pay the zakat upon them. So the zakat is not upon the quantity of the item, or sorry, of the livestock if it's for trade. It's upon the value of the livestock if it's for trade, the nisab, okay? And also the imam, he said, وَحَوْلًا كَامِلًا There has to be a hawl, a complete hawl. We said that the hawl is the lunar year, okay? So the intention uh, for the trading has to be there for a whole year, and the nisab has to be there for a whole year on the trade goods. But here's a mas'ala. What does mas'ala mean? Something which is discussed in fiqh, something which is asked about, it comes from su'al. Mas'ala, one of the mas'ala in this issue about the hawl, is say for example somebody has 10,000 pounds. Now, he's eight months into the year with the 10,000 pounds. Is there this, okay, it's above the nisab, right? But then he decides with this 10,000 pounds, I'm going to trade. So he goes ahead and buys 10 iPhones, 10,000 pounds, right? So now for four months, he has trade stock. What happens here now? What's the problem here that you can see? There's a problem, right? I said trade for the zakat on the trade stock, it has to be with you for how long? The intention for trade of the trade stock has to be with you for a year. So after eight months of having that 10,000 pounds, he decided to invest it in the 10 iPhones, which now he wants to sell, but they're only with him from that time. So he's gonna have to wait a, a whole year, right? But this is not the case. They say, no, the, the hawl, the hawl, the lunar year, is built upon the hawl of the asl, the original hawl, which is the hawl of the wealth. Because it's value. Currency is value, trade stock is value. So as though it's one hawl, it's one item. They share the same uh, essence, which is that it's for value. So in this situation, where the person had 10,000 pounds, and after eight months, he decides to buy trade stock with it, he doesn't have to wait a whole year. Or he's not allowed to wait a whole year, I should say. Rather, he builds it upon the, uh, the time that the money reached the nisab. Okay, so if the nisab was with him for money of eight months, then all he has to do is wait for another four months with the trade stock. Okay, with regards to the hawl. The imam, he says, ثُمَّ يُقَوِّمُهَا And then 
the person, once he's got the nisab and once he's, he's got the hawl, he looks at the value of his trade stock. How does he determine the value of his trade stock? Is it at the value of which he bought it or at the value of which it's now going to be sold for in the market if it was to be sold? It's the value of now. So the person may complain. He said, that's not fair. I bought it for 5,000 pounds and now it's 10,000 pounds, right? But we say to him the opposite is also true, right? You could have bought it for 10,000 pounds, but the value is now down to 5,000 pounds. So Allah is being fair with you. Sometimes the price goes up, sometimes the price goes down. In any case, the taqweem, the computing of the value is done at the market price of the time of when you are to give zakah. The taqweem, the computing of the value is done by looking at the value of the goods which are for trade only. So the building that you use for trade, it's not included in the zakah. Okay, the machinery that you use for the trade is not included in the zakah. The, for example, the shelves that you put the goods on are not included in the zakah. I think these are all termed as fixed assets, right? So fixed assets are not included in the zakah. It's the trade goods themselves, the things that you trade with, they are included in the zakah. If, if the trade goods come to the, um, the lower of the dhahab or fiddah, meaning they come to the nisab of silver, right? We agreed that the majority said the nisab is of silver. So if they reach the value of nisab of silver, then you have to give zakah min qimatiha from the value of them. What does that mean? So you have to give it in terms of money, not from the good itself. Why? He's saying the Imam, once it's reached the Nisab and once it's been with you for a whole year, you have to pay the account on these trade goods. I got 10 iPhones. I'm not allowed to give one of the iPhones as zakah. I have to give from the wealth, uh, the value of the iPhones. Okay, 2.5% of the value of the total of the iPhones, which is 10,000 10, pounds. 2.5 of 10,000 pounds is 250, right? Is that correct? 250, right? So that's what you would pay in the zakah. So the Imam is telling us, give the value. Why the value and not the commodity? Because this is more beneficial. Hada anfa lil fuqara. It's more beneficial. Why? Because you may be trading in sugar, for example. A person might be diabetic. He can't benefit from the sugar. You may be trading in a commodity that a person just really dislikes. He really dislikes it. It's of no benefit to him, right? You're giving him Eskimo jackets, but he lives in a hot country. Right? You trade in Eskimo jackets, it's not benefiting him. But you give him the wealth, that's going to benefit him. So this is why you should trade in, you should give the zakah in the value, not the commodity. But if you're in a situation where you haven't sold your commodities, right? you've got the trade items with you, they're above the nisab, they've been with you for a whole year, you've had the intention but nothing sold. So you have no cash flow. And you cannot give from cash. In this situation you can give from the commodity if you wish to do so or as some of the ulama say like uh, Sheikh Uthaymeen he said in the Majmool Fatawa you can wait until cash comes to you and then you could pay for the years which passed wherein you didn't give zakah due to this reason that we just explained otherwise you have to give it from the value of the trade goods okay the Imam says if the person has the intention of these trade goods after a while that he wants to take some of it for his own use then that which he takes for his own use is now discontinued from the value of the trade goods so if he has the, from those 10 iPhones he takes one of them for himself to be used for his own use then now this one iPhone when it comes to giving zakah is not now included in the overall value okay it's deducted, it's not considered anymore as part of the overall value. So that which you take for yourself out of these trade goods for your own use is no zakah upon that. But if he decides after a month, I want to put it back into trade, right? What's the situation? The situation is that there has to be a whole now, hawl, another lunar year for that particular item, not for the other nine iPhones. The other nine iPhones, they continue with their hole, which is original. But the one which you took out, you change your intention, but then you again change your intention that you want to put it back for sale, then this one, there has to be a hole. There has to be a hole year upon it. Tayyip.
And of course, you shouldn't do that to try to avoid paying zakah. But some people have this sick mentality that I will take some of the trade goods out now. So now it's less than the nisab. I don't have to pay zakah. After zakah time, I put it in. May Allah protect us from having such a heart. Amin. There's one mas'ala here that I'd like to mention to you, mentioned by Sheikh Hamad al Hamad in his explanation of Zad al Mustaqni'. The mas'ala, he says, if one person has a group of camels, five camels, for example, what's on five camels? One sheep, right? If he has a group of camels for trade, so it's not for, uh, it's not for zakat al sa'ima, it's not for the normal zakat of livestock. He has these camels for trade. Their value is like a huge amount that can be the value, right, of camels, especially if they are black camels. He, after six months, changes his mind. The hawl, what happened to the hawl? The hawl didn't complete, right? So he doesn't have to give zakah. But they say, no. He had to give zakah for two reasons. One reason was that it was trade. The other reason he was supposed to give zakah is that it was behemoth al-an'am. It was livestock. They're livestock, they're five camels, and they're above, they're above the nisab, or they're at the nisab, which is five camels, one sheep, right? So the first reason has disappeared, which is that it's trade, because after six months, he changed his mind. He said, I'm not going to trade in them anymore. So this first reason disappears. What remains? The second reason for them having zakah, which is that it's still livestock. So in this situation, the hawl will continue. Okay? He will still have to give zakah upon them when the uh, time comes for paying the zakah. Tayyip, we'll stop here, inshallah. I was hoping to do some more, but I think this is enough for us today, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyin Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions, then feel free.